In this video, I want to talk a little more about the idea of correlation and causation, of, of just having a relationship versus showing that uh, changes in one variable are actually causing changes in, in another. So let's look at a possible study that we could do. And this is, this is stuff we've talked about, but I just want to make sure that this principle is really clear. Let's say we go out and we measure two variables. We could get data on, uh, we could get data on ice cream sales. And we could get data on snake bites. So for any given day of the year, what, how, how many times did people buy ice cream in a particular city? Let's say Phoenix, Arizona. And how many times in Phoenix, Arizona on that day did people get bitten by snakes? And if we were to start to plot data on this graph, we would probably find quite a strong relationship. We would, it would not be perfect, but we might expect to see a very nice correlation between them. And if we were to put a line through that, it would look something like this. So we say, oh, there's a relationship between snake bites and ice cream. But then the question is, does buying ice cream cause people to get bitten by snakes? And pretty obviously, the answer, the answer should be no. There's not really a feasible way that you could imagine buying ice cream leading more people on a massive citywide uh, scale to get bitten by more snakes. Very unlikely. And that is why I like this example, because it shows how just because we found a correlation, it doesn't mean that the one thing is causing the other. And it shows it in a very obvious way. So again, the principle here, the principle here is that correlation, correlation does not imply causation. So with correlation, we've shown that as one of the variables goes up, there's a, there's a predictable, consistent change in the other variable. So as ice cream sales go up, I, uh, snake bites also go up in a consistent, predictable way. But just showing that there's that relationship doesn't mean that the changes in the one variable are causing the changes in the other. But then the question is, why is it that we're not able to show that? Why, you know, why is it that, what is the problem here? And the problem is alternative explanations. Alternative explanations. So in other words, we have shown that ice cream and snake bites change together, that they co-vary, that there's a relationship. One explanation for that relationship would be that snake bites or, or that ice cream sales cause people to get more snake bites. Let me, let me get a little more room here so that I can show this a little better. One explanation is, so we've got our, we've got our two variables. We've got, uh, we've got ice cream and we've got snake bites. And we know that these are related. And one possibility is that ice cream causes snake bites. People go out to buy ice cream. Some pit viper decides that it wants their Heath Bar toffee crunch. Not very feasible. But OK, maybe there's some reason we haven't thought of why ice cream would cause people to get bitten by snakes. But the reason why just showing a relationship is not enough to prove that the one thing causes the other is because of this idea that there's alternative explanations. So we could also say that maybe snake bites cause people to buy more ice cream. You know, people go out, get bit by a snake, they go to the poison control center or the hospital or whatever, and it turns out they're okay, but they've had a rotten day, so they go and buy some ice cream. Neither of those seems like really great explanations, but there's another possibility that is much, much better, and that is, uh, that is the weather whether or you could say time of year. In other words, when it is hot outside, that causes people, let me get a different color, that causes people to go and buy ice cream. And when it is hot outside, it also causes people to go hiking and go out and do outdoor activities, and that leads them to be more vulnerable, more likely to get bitten by a snake. Now, I've picked this example because it's very obvious that that it's silly, that ice cream, going and buying ice cream is not likely to get you bitten by a snake. That is, is painfully obvious here, and that's the point, to show you that there are often, when we demonstrate a relationship between two variables, there's often a third variable. 
And so sometimes this is called the third variable problem. Uh, but there are some other terms, there's some other terminology uh, used to describe these other variables that we're not studying directly in our, in our study. Okay, so let me back up for a minute and just point out that there's not just the weather to consider here. That's a really good possibility. But we've got lots of variables that are present in our study that we, we haven't considered. So there's, for example, there's the gender of the people who are going out and buying ice cream and getting bitten by snakes. That doesn't seem likely to have any relationship to you know any any link in here, uh, but it is present in the study. There's there's their intelligence or their IQ. There is their personality. Personality. Uh, there is also uh, there's also the time of day. Time of day. Maybe that has some influence. Uh, those don't seem like they should be relevant here. And so that is one of, one of the types of variables. A general term we have is the idea of an extraneous variable. This is just the idea that, uh, that there are variables that we have not studied. So an extraneous, I'm sorry, I should put extraneous variable. Extraneous variable is any, uh, any variable other than uh, any variable other than those that we have directly studied. So any variable other than those being studied. In other words, we have not measured or accounted for these variables. We know they're out there. Now, this is a general term. Uh, so gender, time of day, IQ, the weather, all of these things would be considered extraneous variables because all we measured was we just measured ice cream sales and snake bites. Those are the only variables we measured or accounted for in our study. And so this is just something to be aware of that whenever you're doing a study, there's often dozens or hundreds or even thousands of variables that are present in the study that, that you aren't considering, that you haven't measured, that you're not looking at directly. Now, very often, those extraneous variables really are not a concern because there's no feasible way in which they would be relevant. It's really hard to see how something like gender would have an effect on the fact that when people buy more ice cream, they are, they're also getting bitten by more snakes. That there's, it's hard to see how gender would, would account for that relationship. But sometimes there are extraneous variables that would provide very good uh, potential explanations for the relationship we see. And the nice thing about this example is it's easy to see that weather is an extraneous variable because we didn't measure it in our study. Uh, but it goes beyond just being an extraneous variable because it does provide a very good explanation, a better explanation uh, for the relationship that we're observing than anything we actually measured. So that's a big problem in our study. It's a big, uh, we would call it a threat to the internal validity of our study. Big problem. And so, like I mentioned before, these are called third variables. Uh, that's not necessarily the best term for them because uh, in this case, it's a third variable. We have ice cream uh, sales as one variable, snake bites as a second variable. Weather is the third variable we didn't consider, we didn't measure. But it doesn't have to be the third. It could be the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. We might have all kinds of variables that we didn't measure, uh, but that are problematic. So the uh, a better term for this, a more general term, is a confounding. We call these confounding variables. And the idea here, by con when something is confounded, what we what that really means is that it is, they're mixed up. So mixed up together in a way that you cannot disentangle them or see what is happening. So the effects of weather versus ice cream sales versus snake bites, they're all linked together, but they're confounded. They're mixed up. So the way we would say that more technically is a confounding variable. A confounding variable is a, a co-varying extraneous extraneous variable. Well, that's, that's kind of a mouthful. All we're, what we're saying is it's an extraneous variable, meaning that it is a variable uh, that is not one that we have. It's other than those that we have looked at or measured in our study. It's not a variable we've measured. So it's, it's an extraneous variable, but it goes a step beyond that because it is 
because it is co-varying with the variables that we're studying. So ice cream sales go up, whether you know, the temperature uh, increases, the weather is changing. So the weather is co-varying with ice cream sales. It's co-varying with snake bites. That means its effects are confounded. So it is a confounding variable. We cannot, in this case, disentangle those effects, the effects of ice cream uh, sales from the effects of weather, from the effects of snake bites. And so again, just to bring this back to the way we put this before, a confounding variable, it provides an alternative alternative explanation, an alternative explanation, which threatens our, uh, the internal validity of our study, which is just another way of saying that it threatens our ability to actually say that the one variable is causing, that the changes in the one variable are causing changes in the other. So then the question is, if we're having such trouble showing that one variable causes another, how do we, how do, we do that? What approach do we need to take to prove that one thing is causing another. Uh, and the general idea here is that whatever approach we take, it has to be one that gets rid of these confounding variables. I, I say gets rid of them, it has to rule them out in some way. So either we have removed them from our study so they can't have an influence, or we've measured them and shown that they're not, that they cannot account for the changes seen. So we have to in some way eliminate confounding variables in order to, uh, to be able to demonstrate that one thing causes another. And the most common way that we do that, that we eliminate confounding variables, is with an experiment. It's not the only way to do that, but it is the most common way to do it. And that is the point of an experiment, is to show that confounding variables cannot account for the relationship shown. And so the relationship has to be the result of, of the one variable causing the other variable to change.